Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Wow, haven't we, haven't, hasn't this world been through a roller coaster ride in the last two weeks? Wow. Um, you see, yes, as, as Jason has shared about the climate, has become a religion around the world in itself, the climate protesters, and how that, that can become easily entrenched in the Sunday law as, as a guise. Um, how quickly wars start uh, just overnight. Turkey, you know, makes war on, on uh, northeast Syria there and, uh, and northern Syria. And, um, yeah, it's like the world is poised, ready to fall apart. Uh, I, I didn't know that I was preaching today until Thursday night. And... Um, so it was handballed a little bit. Um, I was trying to do a Jonah and run away from it, but but, <laughs> but um, yeah, God uh, had His hand firmly on me. I could see, so so I'm here. That's the important thing. Um, I want to just uh, share with you a story. There was a lady who was on the phone to a, an insurance agent. And the conversation went something like this. Mr. James, Jones, sorry, I, I need to increase my insurance on my house. I need to do it immediately. The agent, Madam, I'd be delighted to, uh, for you to come into my office and sign the papers and, I, and, and give you the coverage that you need, but you need to come in and sign the papers. Lady, I, I need to do it now over the phone. Agent, not possible, sorry, Madam. You, you'll have to come to my office or I'm happy to come to your home, but the papers need to be signed. We can't do it over the phone. Lady, sir, you don't understand. I want to increase my insurance coverage today. The agent. I wish that I could help you, but you need to sign the documents first. Lady. Look, mister, my house is on fire and I need to have insurance coverage right now. You know, there are some things that we can put off and that are not urgent, they're not in a hurry, and that if it's delayed, it doesn't really matter. We've got tomorrow. But you know, there are some things that we can't. Because if there are some urgent, important things that we put off and tomorrow can have eternal consequences. Our preparation for the return of Jesus is one of those things. Amen? It is absolutely vital that our acceptance and our readiness for Jesus' soon return is not delayed. Jesus' return may appear to be delayed, but our preparation for his return should never be delayed. I invite you to turn over to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Now, we know, the, we know the, uh, the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 24 very well. And those of us who have been Adventists for many years talk, know, know that these are the signs. It's talking about the signs of Jesus soon coming. And here Jesus discovers, discusses sorry, the signs of his return. But in Matthew 25, Jesus then discusses the preparation for his return. Matthew 24, Jesus tells us what's going on in the world. But in Matthew 25, he tells us what's going on in the church. Matthew 24, after talking about the false Christs and the false prophets and wars and pestilences and earthquakes and all kinds of dangers and rising crime and violence, plus a whole lot of other signs before Jesus' return, he warns there in Matthew 24 and verse 42, the passage there that um, Kevin shared with us and read to us, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. Therefore be ye also ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And then in Matthew 25, Jesus continues his sermon. Matthew 25 is the same sermon. It's, an, it's a continuation 
of his sermon in Matthew 24. And Jesus gives the first of three parables in this, in this chapter of, about what it means to watch and to be ready for his coming. The parable of the ten virgins speaks with special relevance for his church today. The ten virgins are all Adventists. You know why? Because they're waiting for the advent of the bridegroom. That's us. Just as a doctor would put his stethoscope upon the heart, the chest of his patient, in the same way Jesus is putting his stethoscope on the heart of his church to check out our heart condition, to see what's really going on in our lives. And these three kingdom of God parables do not focus on the world, they focus on the church. They focus on what's happening within our own lives. Ellen White wrote in Review and Herald in August 1890, she said these words, I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five were foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. When I read that, I thought, wow, it is often referred to, Ellen White is often referred to, uh, to this parable by the Lord. And, uh, and so this parable is so important and so significant and so vital for the church today that God brought it to Ellen White's mind and to her attention continually. And because I've preached on this before, I wasn't going to preach on it, but when I read that, that comment, I thought, no, I need to preach on this. And so it's, in, it's so important that I'm bringing it to you again today. So I'd like you to turn over to Matthew 25, if you haven't already got it there, in uh, verses 1 through to 13. Let's read this, this, this story. Beautiful parable, a challenging parable that Jesus um, told. And then he said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels and with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. And then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Verse 11, Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. In the Bible, a woman represents what? A church. A good woman? A good church. A bad woman? A bad church. A virgin? is the same as a young woman has the pure faith, a pure belief, and, uh, and, and follows pure, uh, the uncorrupted doctrines of God's church and of God's word. And all are a part of God's last day church. So that's referring to the Seventh-day Adventist church and all Christians who claim his name and to follow his name. How many of them are there? Ten. It's interesting. You know, 10 is the number that is the minimum number that, that is required to form a Jewish synagogue, which is a church. So that's interesting. The lamps symbolize what? God's word. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. So the Bible, 
God's word illuminates the world as they wait for the bridegroom's return. And notice something else here. They all fall asleep. Interesting. Both the wise and the foolish, they fall asleep. And so if you read that in verse 5, let's have a look. But while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. So this is not an opportunity for anybody to be pointing the finger at anybody else and say, well, you're asleep and I'm not, you know. So if anyone's tired here this morning, man, don't go to sleep, will you? <laughs> we are living on the very knife edge of eternity, on the very verge of Jesus' soon return, and here the church is pictured as though it is asleep, spiritually drowsy, asleep to the great opportunities to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus, the bridegroom. And the world around us with its secularisation and its materialistic outlook and, and focus has, and its godless culture has lulled the church into a spiritual stupor. God has given the SDA Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church, a message and a mission. And he has raised this church to share the light of his word with the whole world that is in darkness. Do you believe that? We need to be um, practicing that as well. I'd, I'd like you to turn to Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 4. Isaiah 60, and uh, chapter 60, verses 1 uh, through to 4. Because Isaiah predicted the destiny of God's church in these words. <clears throat> and it says, Arise, and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. <clears throat> for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes around about, and see, all they gather themselves together. They come to thee, thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. That's an interesting um, prophecy, prediction of God's desire, sorry, and the destiny of his church, right in these last days before Jesus comes, at the time of his return. Jesus is picturing his church, the virgins, the ten virgins, who, who all have, the, have some oil, who all have the word, who are all pure virgins, and who are all Adventists, waiting for the advent of the bridegroom, and are, have all got the oil of the Holy Spirit, some more than others, and there his church, he desires his church to share the word of God, not through just preaching, but through example, through our testimony, through encouraging others to look to, to God and, uh, and, and allowing him to do whatever miracles that he needs to do in our life to bring about the knowledge of, of his love and of his character in this dying old world where Satan has twisted and turned upside down the true nature and the character of God. And so he desires that his people will illuminate the world with his glory and impact the world with his truth and that his mission will be accomplished, his task completed, his work finished and the way will be prepared for the bridegroom to, to return. This is really the destiny and the desire of Jesus for this church. This is our calling and this is the reason for the existence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If we don't have that, then our reason for existence is no longer valid and we become just like any other church. But for the foolish virgins, they fail to participate in God's closing work on earth. If you come back to Matthew 25, come back over in your Bibles to Matthew 25, 
as we continue this, uh, this parable. And verse 3. And, and, and it seems that they missed their great opportunity. Verse 3 says, They that were foolish took their lamps, but what, what was it that separated them from the wise? But they did not take enough oil. They didn't take any spare oil with them. The oil symbolises what? Who? The Holy Spirit. And so for a time they rely upon the Holy Spirit. Their first experience is a positive experience but then after a while, they, they, then they leave the Holy Spirit behind and they go on as though everything depends upon them. Or they fall asleep like the rest. And so the foolish fail to bring that extra oil to see them through the night until the bridegroom returns. They have the oil, they have the Holy Spirit at the beginning, but it runs out until they're left in darkness. In Christ Object Lessons, page 411, it says, This class, represented by the foolish virgins, are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth and are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working fully. They've not fallen upon the rock Jesus Christ and permitted their old nature to be broken. The Holy Spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and his consent, implanting within him a new nature, but the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with the superficial work. They do not know God. How sad. You know, of all the tests and examinations that we have, that we go through in, in life, you know, our, our, our exams and that we go through at school and college and then we have to pass our, our driver's license, you know, and then there are other exams and tests in life, but to fail this one is, is at our eternal loss and we cannot afford to lose this. They do not know God. They have not studied his character nor held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to look and live, and their service to God degenerates into a form. So the foolish virgins are a backslidden Christian. You know, imperceptible to the human eye, only perceptible to God. And I find this a particularly difficult um, sermon to preach on because there are lots of fingers pointing back at me. Backslidden Christians, people who are in the church, who are lost in the church, just like the woman who lost her coin in the church, and she searches and searches until she finds it. Not the lost sheep, but the lost coin, the foolish virgins, who no longer rely on the Holy Spirit in their life, and they lose their hold. You know, in our... Uh, last hymn that we just sang, you know, it says there that grips upon the solid rock. The word grip is very different from the word just, you know, touching or, or, or holding, but gripping. We need to grip hold of Jesus, our rock, more and more as the days go by. And let's start now, today. No longer relying on the Spirit of God in their lives. And they lose their hold and their connection with God. You know, when the waves toss over, have you ever been at the beach and you've been tossed off your feet by a big wave and you look at those little barnacles that are sticking onto the rock? You seen them? How they hang on to that rock, don't they? What's the difference? They grip hold of that rock, don't they? And there's a lesson for us. But their past experience, their past Christian experience, such as their baptism or some other previous high experience in their life, believing that that past experience is enough to keep them going and ready for, the, for Jesus' return. You know, 
believing that that's enough to prepare them for the return of Jesus. Content with a stale experience from the past, even though they acknowledge the truth, the truth has not transformed their lives. And they still operate from the old carnal nature. And it rears its ugly head. And then they give, um, you know, voice and opportunity to this, this side of their natures. Even though they have acknowledged the truth, the truth has not changed their lives. They have a theory of truth, but have not been radically changed by it. They have a casual knowledge about God's church and its doctrines, but they do not have a hard experience. A form without the substance, a theory without the reality, a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And in verse 12, the bridegroom says, I know you not. How sad, how tragic. Turn over to Ezekiel 33 and verse 31. Ezekiel 33 and verse 31. And it says, And they come unto me. This is Ezekiel, the prophet of God, describing some of the problems, you know, with God's church in the Old Testament. And you know, in human nature repeats itself in ages of history. Verse 31, And they came unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. That's sad. Turn over to Second Timothy chapter 3. Second, uh, Second Timothy chapter 3 and verses 1 to 5 and it says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord... Is this the one? No, I've got Second Thessalonians, sorry. There we go. Yeah, in perilous times. This know also that in the last days... This is Second Timothy 3, 1 to 5... That in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be what? Lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away so there's a difference between having God's word in your hand and having it in your heart isn't it there's a difference between being informed by the word and being transformed by it there is a difference between being convinced and being convicted and changed by it then come back to Matthew 25 the story again that we're reading, Matthew 25, and verse 5. And it says, And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered, and they all slept. So this, this verse actually brings up another question that I believe must be answered. Why is it that Jesus' coming appears to be delayed? Why is it that Jesus hasn't come by, from, by now? <clears throat> you know, we're a people who, who shouldn't be here. Did you know that? We shouldn't be here, really. Jesus has longed to come long ago. So why hasn't he come? Is he waiting for more wars or more famines and earthquakes? <laughs> Definitely not. He's waiting for his people. Let's look at, I'm going to look at three reasons why Jesus has delayed his return. First of all, Jesus is waiting in love. He's waiting in love. Matthew 24, verse 14, what does it say? The gospel of this kingdom shall be preached to all the world as a witness to all nations, and then what? Then the end shall come. 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 9, what does it say? But the Lord is not slack. Into his promise, as some men count slackness, 
but he is long suffering to us, would, not willing that any should what? Perish, but that all may come to repentance. That's his desire. He waits for us in love. Desire of Ages, page 633, 634, it says, By giving the gospel to the world, it is our power to hasten our Lord's return. We are not only to look for it, but to hasten the coming of the day of God. Had the Church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would before this have been warned and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and in great glory. Interesting. Education, page 264, Ellen White says the same, something similar. He has put it in our power through cooperation with him to bring this scene of misery that the world is in now to an end. Wow. The second reason. Christ waits for his church to reveal God's character. God's character of love to a waiting world and to a watching universe. How God's church has let down the world who are waiting to see a picture of his love is, has just, you know, the royal commission in, 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 in institutional sexual abuse is a classic example of how society has lost its respect for Christianity and for the church, Christian church. Sadly, even the Adventist church is lumped into all of this. When people look at the Christian church, our church is a part of this. That's tragic. The cross of Christ needs to be uplifted in our life by how we live and, and we have opportunities to refute Satan's charges against God's character, that he is a mal malignant, um, spiteful, you know, God that, that, that hates people. And so the cross of Christ lifted up. You know, when, when how, 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 does, how, did the, how does the world know that we are Christ's disciples? If you have what? Love one for another and love for the world as well love for, for those in the world who need God's gospel and so this is related to the second coming the principle of the of the ripening harvest is a, another parable that Jesus spoke of in Mark chapter 4 so come back to Mark or come ahead to Mark chapter 4 there's this ripening harvest parable which I, I, I want to share with you. Uh, Mark chapter 4 and verses 28 and uh, 29. Okay, Mark 28 and 29, it says, For the earth brings forth fruit for herself, of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and then after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. All right? And you go, oh, yeah, okay. So? So the principle of the ripening harvest suggests that Jesus will return when the seeds of righteousness are fully manifest in God's people in the last days, fully developed in the lives of his church. And the seeds of wickedness is fully developed in the lives of those who reject his good news. Ellen White affirms this harvest principle in this classic statement in Christ Object Lessons, page 69, where it says, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Notice that when the character of Christ is perfectly manifested in his church, that is something that Christ wants to do in us and in his church. But he cannot do it unless we cooperate. It is not us developing a perfect character, you know, with our strength. 
This is God's promise of developing his character in us when we participate in him, with him, when we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives and make him a part and parcel of our daily life, we become partakers of the divine nature and we have Christ living in us the hope of glory. That's what Jesus is waiting for. So the world must see once and for all that the work of the cross is manifest and demonstrated in the lives of God's people. And in other words, God longs to develop a people who are passionate about knowing him, who are consumed with his sharing his love with others, and who are justified by his grace, who are sanctified by his grace, and who one day when he comes will be redeemed by his grace and glorified by his grace. The third reason Christ is waiting to f the f for the full manifestation of wickedness to be revealed in this world. And I guess just like, and, and this is, um, yeah, just like a mother who's caring for a sick child with a fever, you know, healing will not take place until the fever breaks, isn't that right? And it seems that that's, how God is looking upon the world. The fever has to run its course before it finally breaks and then healing and then recovery. And in the book of Revelation, we've got two harvests. You know the harvest where it talks about the golden grain, the communities of believers, his, his saved church, and then you have the other uh, harvest of the, of the grapes which revealed... Uh, a full display of sin and wickedness and rebellion in this world. The two harvests reveal God's way of redeeming love and how it brings life, whereas the other harvest demonstrates Satan's way of selfishness and strife and violence and how it brings death and destruction. In Fifth Testimonies, page 524, Ellen White says, God keeps a reckoning with the nations. And when the time fully comes that iniquity shall have reached uh, the stated boundary of God's mercy, his forbearance will cease when the accumulated figures in heaven, in heaven's record books, shall mark the end, uh, end sum of transgression is completed. God's wrath shall, shall come. Prophets and Kings, page 417, says it, in, a, in, a, in another way, in a shortened way. There it says, There is a limit beyond which the judgments of Jehovah can no longer be delayed. And so the church, God's church, has it within our power to hasten the coming of Jesus. But the church cannot delay Jesus coming forever, indefinitely. Let's get back to the story of the foolish virgins and the wise virgins, because we mustn't forget the wise ones as well. In Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, it says, The danger that they faced was putting off the decision. It was more than just falling asleep at the airport when the plane was about to take off, but they put it off and put it off and put it off. You know, they prevaricated in that decision that with enormous consequences. I was talking to a young lady um, this week and she has two cars. And, uh, and so that when it came time for the registration papers to come, she ignored the first one and never paid the registration papers. And then the three months passed and then of course she had to hand the plates in. She still didn't hand the plates in and got a uh, $100 fine and had to pay for that. And then was caught driving the car without, a li you know, without it being licensed and had to pay another fine for that. Then it was impounded in the, you know, in, in the police yard and then had to pay another fine to get it released. You know? And then the second car, the same thing. True. How, how, lo how much does it take <laughs> to make us learn? <laughs> I was horrified when I, when I heard the story and I thought, man, but you know what? How more important is being ready for the coming of Jesus? Hmm? 
In verse 6, it says at midnight, at midnight, the darkest hour of earth's history. Yeah, the darkest hour of earth's history. They weren't ready. And in verse 7 and 8, Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Reminding us that we cannot walk into heaven on the experience of others. That your fathers and your mothers and that your children and your grandchildren, grandparents, friends, faith, their faith will not get you into heaven. We can't piggyback others into the kingdom. Neither can we be piggybacked into the kingdom. In Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 20, Ezekiel reminded the people of Israel, though there be a Noah and a Daniel and a Job among you, even though they were in it as I live, says the Lord, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness, which is Christ's righteousness. And so a second-hand experience will never do. Each has his or own experience and, and friendship connection with the Lord. And only that experience and that relationship is enough, is, is sufficient to get us into his kingdom. But Satan has lulled us into a sleep. And you know, the old devil was having, and this is not a true story, but the old devil was having a meeting, you know, with his evil angels. And they were trying to work out ways to keep people out of heaven. And so one angel spoke up and he said, I will tell them that there is no God. And Satan said, no, 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 that, that will never work because the evidence from nature, the Bible prophecies, change lives is too great. You must think of something else. So the second angel, he spoke up. I'll, I'll tell them that there is no truth. So Satan said, no, you may deceive some that way, but thinking people are going to recognise that just as there is scientific truth, there must be religious and moral truth. No, think of something else. And then a third angel came up with a brilliant idea. He says, I will tell them that there is no hurry. There is plenty of time. Put off making the decision. Whoa, he says, that one. Tell them there is plenty of time. Tell them there is no need for urgency. Tell them to put off their personal preparation. Tell them to wait until a more convenient time to deal with their inner attitudes and their heart problems and their, their sin. Tell them that there is, that there is no, uh, no need to be in a hurry at all about a personal relationship with God. And that reflects the weakness within every one of us as human beings, doesn't it? It does. And so God is calling us to do something. Something that we are putting off. Are we putting off the oil being filled in, into our lamps? Are we putting off holding that lamp and sharing that lamp so that the light... I'll keep bumping this thing. So that the light that illuminates our pathway can illuminate the pathway of others until Jesus comes. Are our attitudes need changing? Do we, do we struggle with jealousy and pride Are we easily irritated by others? Do we have a heart work that needs to be done? Do we have a, a heart surgery that needs to be worked on? God's calling for his church to love him deeply and supremely and to share his message of love passionately. Would you like to commit yourself or recommit yourself today so that God can fully receive you back those of you who have wandered away and those who want to recommit themselves because the only way to be ready for Jesus' return is to commit our life fully to him and remain committed to him today, tomorrow, right through to the end until Jesus comes. And if there's anything lurking in your life, in my life, that we may not be fully aware of, 
then ask the Lord to please reveal it to us. And I'm willing to surrender any habit attitude that is not in harmony with you, dear God. If that's your desire, why not give over your life today, again right now, by asking him to forgive your complacency, to plead with him for a revival of true godliness in your own soul. And I'm going to invite you as a church that if you wish to do that, then I'm going to invite you to to bow your heads or kneel if you desire. Um, I think it would be great if we kneeled together as a church if you can and recommit your life, our life, completely again to Jesus. And I'll give you all, this will be done silently, quietly, for say two minutes and then when everybody's back on their seats with their heads up, then I'll take that as a sign then that we are ready and then I'll have a closing prayer and then we'll sing our last hymn. Let's, let's do that, please. I'd invite you just to bow your heads as I pray. Father in heaven, you have heard each one's prayer this morning. And I would ask you, Lord, that you and your Holy Spirit will be poured into each one's heart, that each person will experience the fullness of your Spirit in their life. Please breathe your life and your love and passion for others who don't know you lo your love, Lord. Ignite your church and your heart and our hearts, Lord, with the light, the truth, and the power of your word, so that we will faithfully share it to our families, to our friendship networks, and to the world in darkness, that the end may come, and that we can return, that we that that you can return, and that we each one be ready for you and your return, dear Jesus. In your in your name, we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our last hymn together. Hymn number 309. All to Jesus I surrender. In order for us to be ready for the return of Jesus, it requires a daily surrender to Jesus. Without that surrender, then we'll not be ready. Savior, I surrender. 
whose feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender, I surrender. Let's pray. Our wonderful God, we thank you so much that you've given us this warning message because of your great love for us. And as we've read in Scripture, that, Lord, that you are not willing that any should perish. Of your love is an abounding love, your character is love, and, and Lord, you want us that each of us will be ready and that we will have a daily living um, vibrant relationship with you that your spirit lord will live and abide in us that we can be partakers of your divine nature not because of anything that we are doing or done but because of you living in us ministering to us and through us help us to depend upon you lord just as a child depends upon his parents and lord that uh, your spirit will fill us and bless us in this coming week and as we uh, share and reach out to others for your glory, for your return, we pray that we will be faithful in doing that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.